and welcome to Women in Focus. I'm Mposa Tole. Thank you for joining us. While it's important to pursue equal rights for women through various programs, society often neglects the young men who make up some of the country's most vulnerable communities. In a world that's uh, deeply misogynistic, which heightens the vulnerability of the black girl child, what needs to be done to curb the societal ills? Challenges like poverty, unemployment and a lack of access to education and abuse without socially ignoring the boy child. Now, to unpack this even further, I've got guests in studio. Uh, I've got uh, registered uh, psycho psychometrist uh, Marjena Almeida, as well as uh, Teddy Bay Clinic's uh, Dr. Shahi Omar, as well as actress uh, Mother uh, uh, Balesa uh, Mutuminyane. Welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, uh, ladies, it's going to be a heated discussion here. Yeah, it's a really, really uh, sentimental topic. But uh, before I come to you, I want to start with our guest on, on Skype who joins us, uh, Dr. Omar. Thank you for your time. A very good morning to you. Um, it, it really is a, 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 a situation uh, and a topic that talks about the, the impact of the dynamics of, of uh, uh, challenges like single-headed households. And are, have... have parents um, uh, played some sort of role here in, in socializing the bo boy child, irrespective of whether it's, it's a, it's a woman-headed household or, or a male-headed household. What sort of role have they played? So thank you for having me on the show and, 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 and good morning to all the other guests on the panel. I would like to just raise something that is very critical in terms of the fact that we are finding, we, we know we're living in, in a history of inequalities as, as you have so aptly described. But if we look at toxic masculinity, we look at patriarchy. And as we know that many of the children who are actually the primary caregivers, it is usually a female, it is usually a mother or some other relative, but it is usually most of the times a female. And we find that this socialization of feeding into raising children, what kind of uh, uh, messages are actually conveyed? So it's feeding into the patriarchy and into the toxic masculinity where it's feeding into the notion of it's okay, this that it's okay for females to be abused. It's okay for females to be victims. And females have the right, of course, now as we see there's a shift that they are allowed to come out into the open and make those disclosures, stand up and break the silence. Yet we find that those same mothers or caregivers are raising not only the girl child, but they are raising the boy child as well. And what messages are they giving to the boy child in terms of patriarchy and mass toxic masculinity? So it's feeding that information to the boy child that yes, boy, boy children or boys are not sissies, boys don't cry, boys, boys are expected and assumed to be strong and to exert power. And how do they exert power? The only way they exert power is by assuming this uh, notion of patriarchy where they are not only seen as providers, but they are seen to be holding those positions of power and authority and are allowed to assert it, whether it's aggressively or not. And, and boys are not uh, assumed or even expected to become victims of abuse. So permission is not given to boys. So if a boy or a male has been a victim of any form of abuse, it is not received in the same way that a girl, the girl child is, it's expected that girls are victims. And yet if we look at the statistics, 36% of girls become victims of child sexual abuse and 29% of boys become victims of child abuse. So again, if you, that's again, and that's according to the uh, UN Commission of Human Rights. And again, if we look at one in four girls are victims of abuse and one in seven boys, but looking at the research on the ground and a lot of our clinical findings, we are finding that the uh, statistics on the boy child is not accurate. It's actually underreported, and that a lot more boys are victims of sexual abuse, but 
to not feel uh, powerful enough to come out into the open because of the stigma, because of the responses that are elicited by society, because the standard norm or the social norm is that only the girl child or females are subjected to abuse. So we need to actually go back and review our socialization. What is it that as mothers we need to revisit, review as females of society and uh, look at this dynamic and diversity and, of course, differences in gender equality issues. Okay, I'm, I'm bringing this uh, discussion back in studio. Um, let me start with you, Marjena. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a, a, a startling amount that she points out here in terms of the figures and the statistics, some, some really frightening numbers there. In your expertise, um, if we have to analyze and look at the difference between the boy child and, and the girl child, what have you found to stand out uh, when it comes to the biology of the boy child? So from a physiological point of view, you know, we always want to argue that there are so many uh, or so little differences between the two, but physiologically we are different. If we look at in utero, uh, boys are exposed to testosterone, which actually slows down the maturation of your, your prefrontal uh, cortex, which means that boys are slower to develop things such as empathy, um, emotional intelligence, and this does manifest when you see your child uh, into kindergarten. And boys are a little bit slower when it comes to language proficiency, writing skills. However, they are stronger when it comes to their spatial reasoning, uh, their problem solving, their planning, where girls are at a slight deficit. Now, I think what is poignant and what I want to bring up from, from this is the fact that because boys are slower to develop in terms of EQ and empathy, they do find it difficult to express emotion. And from a social perspective, when boys do cry, when boys do show emotion, we do stifle them. Remember the saying, big boys don't cry, rub some dirt in it. Come mm, on, you're a big boy, up. you don't man up. So we're teaching our boys that it's not optimal or it's not healthy for them to be displaying those signs of emotions. And what manifestations are these having on our boys later on in life if they don't know how to express emotion? Melissa, you're a mother. Uh, you're a mother of, of uh, teenagers and, and adults at this point in time. You have uh, both a f uh, girl child and boy mm -hmm. child. In terms of, of your parenting as a mother and, and, and having to navigate through the different sexes, what are you finding to be your most uh, deepest challenges there? Okay, um, yes, I'm, born. I'm a mother, right? I'm a mother of three, you know, two girls and one boy who is now almost a teenager, a 14-year-old boy. But um, as a mother, I'd like to say that, you know, um, charity begins at home. It is very important, you know, um, for us, especially as mothers, I'd like to say that uh, to always make sure that um, at least we do have that relationship between uh, with our children. And why my issue right now is that, um, you know, I'm a single mother, I'm a divorced woman, and um, I'd like to also say that it's very important that as single mothers, we also make sure that we keep that relationship between our children and their fathers. You know, okay. I make sure I try to make sure by all means that my son has a relationship with his father and they get along very well. You know, so I think that it's also important for men out there to engage and to be involved in their son's lives. Because at the end of the day, we do need that manly guidance, you know, with men, uh, with uh, boy children and father children. And yes, of course, in these days, you cannot force, you know, other parents or other fathers not, uh, to not be involved in their children's life. So uh, you do have fathers that uh, choose that make a choice that they don't want to be involved. But then I would like to say that it is very important for men to always be there for their boy children and to also guide them. And us as single mothers as well, as women, we must also make sure that um, there is that relationship. We do not, um, we do not uh, you know, put, uh, separate their uh, children from their fathers. I think that would also help as well. Let me take uh, the discussion to Dr. Omar. I mean, I know that uh, you don't have much time with us, uh, but uh, Balisa raises uh, some, something really important here, speaking about how charity begins at home. And you mentioned uh, in great depth there, Dr. Omar, about uh, the reasons why single-headed households uh, may, may be, um, you know, uh, perhaps uh, uh, lacking uh, if, if, if it's a woman-headed household, maybe 
lacking and, and experiencing a, a whole array of challenges when it comes to building and empowering this boy child. Just uh, uh, what are your thoughts around that? And, and, and sort of perhaps what sort of advice do you have in terms of forging these relations between the father if he's around to ensure that this boy child really is a, a rounded, um, a confident young man? So I think Palisa, thank you for that. I think Palisa has raised something very, very important. Uh, and, and in our work with young sex offenders, these are boy children who are violating against other children, sexually offending. And what we have learned or the lessons learned is that even in families where there is a paternal presence, there's often that lack of emotional connection. So it is really essential that there is an adequate male role model. It doesn't always have to be the biological father. It could be somebody that's a surrogate figure, whether it's a grandfather, whether it's an uncle, but some significant other, whether it's an educator or a sports coach, but some kind of relationship where the child and, and be given not only in terms of support, but validation and, and learning positive uh, behaviors and responses, but one should not exclude the role and importance of the mother. And of course, we say the boy child needs the adult male role model, but they need the adult female role model as well to come into the equation in terms of support, in terms of responses, but also in terms of expectations, what is allowed, what is not allowed, and also in terms of the child's boy child's roles and responsibilities because often so much power is attributed to a male child. That seems to be a social norm where the male child, it's okay for a male child to assert uh, any kind of forceful behavior, physical force. Uh, it will not be frowned upon uh, as sharply or severely if it is demonstrated by a female child, there's immediate shock and horror. And I think that is something that one needs to look at now in terms of not just within a family context, but not even on a national level. Internationally, the family social norms, the family expectations, that there shouldn't be such polarities around expectations of acceptable behaviors and unacceptable behaviors. Yes, our learned colleague did identify in terms of EQ and empathy, but that can soon be overcome as the male child grows up. And I think that is one of the key ingredients or essential components in raising families about actions having consequences, acceptable behaviors and unacceptable behaviors. And it's about uh, you know, relearning and reinforcing those kind of uh, behaviors. It is important that children start learning from the cradle that, yes, there are biological differences, but at the end of the day, each person has a right, a responsibility, and there are certain responses that will be tolerated and others that will not be tolerated. So, uh, adult and female, both adult role models are essential in raising children and it's about, again, the social behavioral patterns that are transferred to children. Thank you so much uh, for your time and your expertise and input in this discussion, Dr. Omar. Um, I know that you, you have to dash and we are also running out of time in studio. So thank you for your input. Uh, ladies, let me come back to you. Marjena, she, uh, Dr. Omar raised a really important point here. Speaking about the power which is attributed to the boy child. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm also a mother of uh, both boys and girls, Balisa. And um, uh, I've come across households where you find that, um, for instance, a boy child is is, is sitting and, and watching TV while the girl children are, are doing dishes the dishes and doing the chores. And yeah, this. and I've often mm. asked, uh, how is this possible? Why is this allowed? What message are we sending mm. to these uh, boy children? In terms of power dynamics, Marjena, um, what, what have you found in your line of work? I think socially, we've just been historically socialized to give certain roles to the girl, ch girl child and the boy child. Look at the, the gifts that we buy for our little girls. We buy them the ironing sets, the vacuum cleaners, the brush and brooms, and the boys, they get their tool sets or their guns, you know. So 
we assign roles to the girl child as well as the boy child. And I think we need to be cognizant that if we want to reach a stage of equality, we need to be practicing what we preach as well. So why can't we buy a boy a little dolly if he so desires? You know, it's, it's looked upon and... <laughs> You know, people think, oh my goodness, you're going to, you're going to sway him, you're yes. going to impact him. I think that we have tremendous power in terms of breaking down those norms that society has constructed and changing the way in which our boys are socialized. The power lies within us as mothers and as fathers. And in terms of the power lying in your hands as a single uh, mother, Balesa, how, how, what sort of advice would you give to other mothers in terms of uh, also just assessing the challenges that you've had to overcome as, as a single parent? No, um, what I try to do mainly is to spend more time as much as I can with uh, all my children and treat them as equal as possible. Like right now you're talking about, you know, when boys are probably watching TV and little girls washing dishes. In my home, my son washes dishes if the sister is not around. So it is just like that. I try to treat them as equal as much as possible. But then I just want to go back quickly, you know, to what she said. You know, when um, the truth is like, I've got a son and I can't imagine myself buying my son a door. <laughs> you know, because I mean, he'll, probably, yeah, he'll probably also look at me and think, Mom, what are you saying? You know, he'll probably laugh at me. Also because, you know, they, they live outside, they uh, meet with other boys outside. And now imagine when other boys at schools, you know, are finding out that their friend, their boyfriend, you know, is, is playing with a doll. It's actually kind of, you know, mm. yeah. But then I think like, you said it's a background it's how we all grew up that is how we're all taught when we grew up mm. that girls uh, do the ironing and then boys play soccer and you know what i mean so i think it also comes with that background on how, on how we grow up but it's important that now in this day in, in, in these days that we teach our children that it is okay to play with a doll if you're a boy <laughs> <laughs> i suppose you know and it is okay for is a girl a to play, uh, to play soccer yeah. you know but then i think it also it depends you know on how on how you teach your children mm. at home and how you treat them and I think um, the, the most important thing is try to love them as equal, as much as possible. Yeah, you know, but not... at the crux of this matter is the emotional aspect. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dr. Omar pointed out that uh, boys, boys are not accepted when it comes to expressing their emotions, no. being told to man up. How, how do we then, as, as mothers, as, as parents, mm -hmm. now affirm our children, our boy children, to, to know that it is okay to, to express some sort of emotion? I mean, you mentioned that uh, boys are, are slower in developing uh, empathy mm -hmm. um, in terms of, of how uh, the biology, uh, biological aspect of that is concerned. So it, it, I, think, I think it's important. I think we have, we have a, a role here to play mm -hmm. in terms of affirming these young men to, to really feel like it's okay to yeah. express your emotions. Absolutely. It doesn't make you less of a man. Absolutely. Well, Mpo, as you aptly said as well, uh, from a mother perspective, it's important to teach our boys to relay those emotions, but not just as mothers, as fathers as well. You know, all too often I peer around and I see uh, fathers saying to their sons or moms saying to their sons, just get up, don't cry. It's okay to feel those emotions. We need to be cognizant that the way in which we treat our children, if we are seeking true equality, the way in which we treat our girls in giving them a hug when they're not feeling um, happy or if they're feeling sad, we need to treat our boys in those same ways. We need to teach them it's okay to feel pain, it's okay to feel unhappy. Because the manifestations, not to say that there's a linear cause between you know, suppressing emotion and uh, ill behavior later on in life. But the manifestations can be quite startling if you look at the Oscar Pistorius's or, you know, so on and so forth. There's a lot of other factors at play. But what I am saying is that if we're not teaching boys to, to feel emotion, to empathize, to, um, yeah, to, to really um, voice what they are feeling, then there can be manifestations later on in life. And what are these uh, danger zones? I mean, we, we saw how the Sandile Mansour case yes. with Garabo Mugwena played out, and we saw this cold 27-year-old uh, um, uh, man standing in court, really just uh, feeling detached from this case, having to ask, uh, what should I apologize for? Yeah. Really not uh, uh, piecing everything together that, you know, um, it's all 
because of your actions that mm. this mm. amounted to mm. a death of, of a young woman. Mm. But then, um, what I want to ask is, especially in the case of Sandy Le Manzui, who do we really blame here? Mm. Do we blame Sandy Le Manzui or do we look at his background, you know, and do we maybe also go and look at, you know, how he actually grew up, the mother figure or the, mm. the father there? That's my question because I'm worried that I've got a boy child, I'm a single mother, yes, I do make sure that he's got a relationship with the father, but it's one thing when I let my child, you know, cry in the house in my home and hug her, but when he goes to the father mm. and then the father goes and says, men up, you know, mm. so and then at the end of the day, you're like, mm. okay, how do you deal with such as a mother, as a single mm. mother, mm. you know, to keep that balance, to say, when I say this, the father must also, mm. you know, play the same role that I'm trying to play Absolutely. here, you know, and who yeah. do we actually blame when you can look at that case of Sandy Le Mans? Um, so, Palesa, to answer your question, and before I do that, perhaps, I just want to state categorically that it's, it wasn't just one thing that led him to uh, uh, commit those atrocities. Mm. It wasn't the fact that he wasn't able to relay his emotions. So there are multiple variables at play, and he probably does suffer from, you know, his own psychopathology. Uh, I cannot say that because mm. I haven't assessed it myself. Yeah. But to mm. answer your question in terms of who is at fault here, mm. from an ecosystemic perspective in psychology, you know, when somebody manifests, for example, this particular gentleman, he's what mm. we call the IP, the identified patient. Okay. But if we look at the grand context of things, there are a whole different uh, series of variables at play. There was a mother or a lack of a mother figure at play, the father figure, perhaps aunts, uncles, friends, his home environment, uh, perhaps even the way in which he was birthed. Was it a traumatic birth? Was there any mm. brain injury? There are so many multiple variables at play that we cannot pinpoint one thing to blame. You know, that is its fault. So probably so looking basically at... We can, we can still say that, like, go back to where we say charity begins at home yeah. and that everything probably started on how we bring up our boy children. Look, it's also a nature versus nurture debate as well. So he probably, in all actuality, has a predisposition towards committing atrocities. But within that, he probably was raised in an environment that uh, created those predispositions that gave it the opportunity for his, um, his character flaws to come out, if that makes sense in yeah. layman's terms. Yes. So it was a culmination of his environment as well as his biology. Yeah, it's quite hard hitting. You know, I'd just like to say then maybe then it's important to not only look at um, the way we raise our girl children as well. So I suppose that we should also give the same, you know, um, emotions and attention to our boy children as well. Absolutely. Yeah. The yeah. Because at the end of the day, we also go back to us. the girls and we can still say, the way I look at it, I also look at Garabo and I say, how did it come about that a mother also let a, such a young girl, you know, go out and do all the things that you, you know, that they're doing. I don't know, because I also see these young girls in Sentin cities, very young girls, and they're driving expensive cars, they're wearing expensive fare, and I look at them, I'm like, at this age, you know, I could not afford these things. How did it come about that all these young girls, they go around in fleshy, expensive cars, they're dating blessers, be older men, as, as old enough to be their grandfathers mm -hmm. or mothers, you know. Mm -hmm. How, what role do we as parents now play? I mean, my, I've got a 22-year-old girl, and I worry a lot, you know, and I ask myself, you know, what is it that I now should teach her and not teach her so that at least I don't see what I see in other girls in, you know. I, I think it's quite um, important to affirm our children, to tell them that you're good enough and and that you know um, that you you can whatever you dream of of becoming is possible, but you have to work through the challenges of having to perhaps go through university and 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 not just uh, strive for for the limelight and and the, mm -hmm. the easy way there. I mean uh, the the initiatives uh, that that are are aimed at empowering the girl child to be honest, are, are far greater than the boy child. So the, the discussion really here that, that, we, that we're having is to find ways to, to leverage the, the, the boy and the girl child so that they're both empowered with the tools. And, and if should they decide to, to not um, um, use the tools that they have and, and make their own decisions, but the, the foundation needs to be set. Foundation. Absolutely. Look, I think there's no getting away from it that women have been persecuted historically for decades, hundreds and hundreds of years. And that is why we have platforms that are uplifting yes. young women and girls. 
Saying that, however, I think we have made progress. I think that we'll probably only see progress in the next 50 to 100 years when there is true equality. Mm -hmm. If it can ever be true equality, that's another debate on its own. Mm -hmm. But I think in doing so and in pursuing the upliftment of young women, we shouldn't forget our young men either. Yes, because if you yes. look at statistics in South Africa and internationally, boys are not particularly academically inclined. If we have to look from a global panoramic uh, perspective, boys don't achieve as, as girls do. So mm -hmm. if girls are being given the support constantly, what is the effect going to be had in the next 100 years? Mm -hmm. uh, and I speak with caution. It's not to say that, I mean, girls are still... There are no, um, there are still very little equal opportunities when it comes to male counterpoints, uh, counterparts with their girls. Even in the workplace, we in see the it workplace, playing. we're still mm -hmm. seeing women are still notoriously underpaid. Mm -hmm. You know, for we the are, same role that a man would have. Absolutely, mm -hmm. we're penalised for having children. So when you look at stats mm -hmm. from the age of thirty, mm -hmm. you know, women's incomes do drop as opposed to their male counterparts because we are being penalised for child rearing practices. But what I am saying is that this continuous support towards women. What manifestation will that have on our boys in the next 100 years? And that's where we leave it, ladies. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for watching at home. Of course, South Africans, the onus is upon us as, as parents, as, as role shakers within society to make a difference and have our voices heard, to empower both the boy child and the girl child. Thank you for watching Women in Focus.